Hi, I'm Carla Jones, Senior Director of Federalism and International Relations at ALEC, and we're honored to be here in Colorado with Professor Rob Nadelson. He was a law professor for 25 years, serving at three different universities, and now heads the Independence Institute's Article 5 Information Center. He's currently the most published active scholar on the amendments process in the United States. U.S. Supreme Court justices have relied explicitly on his research in eight cases, sometimes several times in the same case. And he has been cited in, on constitutional and non-constitutional subjects in numerous federal appeals court cases. In addition to his work on U.S. constitutional issues, he's published extensive historical and legal research on the Montana State Constitution, creating the database, the Documentary History, of the ratification of Montana's Constitution. And in conjunction with his eldest daughter, Rebecca, he edited the first internet versions of the Roman Emperor Justinian's Great Roman Law Collection in Latin. We at ALEC know him as a member of our Board of Scholars, author of ALEC's Article 5 Handbook for State Lawmakers, and a trusted and steady advisor on constitutional law and Article 5. He's also a friend. And we're fortunate to have him with us today to discuss the Article 5 process for states to propose constitutional amendments and to answer our questions on it. So let's get started. It's great to be here, Rob. It's great to have you here in the great American West, Carla. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's get started. Why did the founders include an amendment procedure in the Constitution? Well, Carla, the historical record tells us there were really four reasons. One is that the founders, although they were very great men, also recognized they were fallible. That was part of their greatness. And they recognized that there might be something in the Constitution that was a mistake that needed to be corrected uh, as a result of experience. And so they included an amendment process for that purpose. They also recognized that the Constitution is a, is a legal document. And because it's a legal document, it's going to be interpreted. And people will disagree sometimes with authoritative interpretations, even from, even from the Supreme Court. So the amendment process was one way of resolving these uh, interpretive disputes. In addition, the founders, if you recall, were in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. There had already been great changes and more great changes were coming. And so they, they knew there might be new developments that would require changes in the Constitution hence an amendment process. And then fi finally, they recognize, as is true with all governments, that dysfunctions and abuses might creep into the system. And the amendment process was a way that the people could respond to any dysfunctions or abuses. Have we adopted amendments for all of those reasons? Well, showing how prescient the founders were, the answer to that question is, we've adopted amendments for all four. Um, a good example is the Bill of Rights itself. The Bill of Rights was, the first eight amendments of the Bill of Rights were adopted in order to forestall potential abuses that might arise from the exercise of federal powers. Uh, we've also passed other amendments to address abuses. Uh, probably the best known would be the amendments we passed after the Civil War to protect minorities from, from, uh, from state oppression. So that was one of the one reason for bringing about amendments. Uh, we've also had amendments to respond to new developments. When the Constitution was adopted, people traveled by foot or by horse-drawn carriage or horseback or barge or sailing ship. And so they had to leave a long period of time between the time a president was elected and the time he actually got to Washington, D.C. Right. to pick up the administration. So in the original Constitution, the president was not um, was not inaugurated till March. But by 1933, we had the automobile, we had railroads, we had airplanes, we had fast ships, no longer necessary to wait all the way to March. And so they moved through the 20th Amendment, the inauguration day, up, till, uh, uh, up to January. Um, then the area of uh, drafting errors in the Constitution. Pretty early on, they discovered uh, an omission in the Constitution. The Constitution had listed qualifications for the president, for 
members of the House of Representatives and for senators, but they had not listed any qualifications for the vice president, probably because they just forgot. <laughs> and so the founding generation adopted the 12th Amendment in 1804, which specified that the vice president uh, has the same qualifications as, as the president. And then finally, there's the issue of interpretive disputes, mm -hmm. right? Um, this also arose within the first few years after the Constitution was adopted. In 1793, the Supreme Court decided a case in a display of judicial activism, which expanded its own powers. Well, at that time, people who had been involved in the drafting and adoption of the Constitution were in Congress, and they said, this isn't what we intended. And so they passed in record time the 11th Amendment, which overruled uh, the Supreme Court. And Carla, we've actually had two other constitutional amendments which have overruled um, uh, Supreme Court decisions, including the 14th mm -hmm. and, and the 26th. So the answer, answer to your question is yes, we've adopted amendments for all four purposes. Okay. And for those of us who have forgotten everything we learned as children about civics, U.S. government, what are the procedures for adopting constitutional amendments? And also, would you mind telling us what the 14th Amendment and the 26th Amendment were? Oh, the 14th Amendment is a very long amendment. It's the longest one ever adopted. Mm -hmm. But the uh, part that overruled the Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. was the part called the Citizenship Clause that clarified who was a citizen of the United States. And it overruled the notorious 1857 Supreme Court decision of Dred Scott versus mm -hmm. Sanford, which had held that a black man could never be a citizen of the United States. The 26th Amendment was adopted. Uh, it had to do with who had the ability to vote. Congress mm -hmm. had passed legislation permitting 18-year-olds to vote in both federal and state elections. The U.S. Supreme Court said this was constitutional as to federal elections, unconstitutional as to state elections. People said this creates a very difficult situation. And so they adopted the 26th Amendment, which overruled the part which says that 18-year-olds could not vote in, uh, in, in, in state elections. Okay. Um, so you're going to have to repeat your question. Oh, no <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, what are the procedures oh, for right. adopting right. constitutional amendments? And I'm sorry yeah, for that detail right. there, there, but there it was are, interesting. <laughs> it's quite all right, Carla. <laughs> there are four. By the way, you often hear people say there are two procedures for amending the Constitution. That shows that the person really doesn't know very much about mm -hmm. it. There are four. There are two procedures for ratification and two procedures for proposing an amendment. Every amendment has to be ratified by three quarters of the states. That's 38 today. Mm -hmm. But there are two ways to do it. One is for the state legislatures to ratify, and one is for conventions, popularly elected conventions in the states to ratify. We've done both. Uh, we adopted the 21st Amendment, repealing prohibition through conventions. We've ado we adopted our other amendments through state legislatures. And then, in addition to that, there are two ways to propose amendments, because the states aren't free to ratify anything that hasn't been duly and properly proposed. So two ways to ratify, two ways to propose, two times two is four, mm -hmm. four methods. Um, one way is for Congress to propose an amendment by passing a resolution garnering a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate. The president's signature is not necessary. The other way, and this is what has not been used yet, is for the states to propose an amendment mm -hmm. through an assembly called a Convention for Proposing mm -hmm. Amendments. Once the amendment is proposed, then Congress, whichever way it's proposed, then mm -hmm. Congress chooses, is this amendment going to be ratified by the states or by state conventions? And then the procedure is the same as we've used 20, 27 times in the past. Okay. And so why do you think we haven't used that particular proposal method? You mean the convention propo proposal method? Correct. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I've thought about that quite a bit. I think there really are two reasons, Carla. One applies to the period of American history before 1960 or 1970. The other applies to the subsequent American history. Our, our experience was before about 1970 when 
an amendment idea became popular, if Congress didn't act and the states started gathering together, submitting their formal applications for a convention, then Congress responded by proposing the amendment on its own. A good example is the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. The Bill of Rights was proposed by Congress in, pa in, in part because Representative James Madison stood up in Congress and said, if you don't propose this, the states will force a convention. And two states had already applied for a convention. This also happened with the 17th Amendment, which um, provides for direct election of U.S. senators. We almost had a convention, and at the last minute, Congress went ahead mm -hmm. and proposed on its own. And it also happened with the 22nd Amendment, which limited the president to two terms. You had an active campaign going on among the states, and finally Congress agreed to propose the amendment by itself. The story is somewhat different for after about 1960s, 1970s. Um, a, a group of people who did not want any kind of constitutional amendment to limit the power of the federal government in any way, but who were very powerful themselves in mass opinion making, in academia, in the media, started to put out a story uh, to the effect that the convention is a mystery. We don't know how it's composed. We don't know what its powers are. We don't know if it could be a runaway convention. There are a whole lot of things. It's a, it's a big mystery, and you need to be scared of this process. This was in some cases deliberate, in some cases not deliberate, voter suppression, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, what, trying to frighten people away from exercising their constitutional rights. But it was remarkably effective. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was picked up by a lot of left-wing organizations, by a small group of right-wing organizations, and by major media outlets, like the Washington Post and the New York Times. And they have flooded the American public with that story which, in fact, Carla, has zero legal or historical validity. And so how would the convention proposal method work? Okay. The, the convention itself is what is known as a convention of the states. Uh, we've had about 42 conventions of states and before independence colonies. So we're very, very familiar with how this process works. In fact, we had one in 2017 in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the way it works first is that uh, a, a state or a Congress or a prior convention, or in the case of Article 5, Congress issues what's called a call. Uh, the call is an invitation to the states to come to, the, uh, to a convention. Now, in the case of Article 5, if two-thirds of the states demand that Congress call, then Congress must do so, right? So um, uh, at that point, after the call, each state legislature says, are we going to participate in this? And I think for a convention for proposing amendments, they all would say yes. And then they decide how they're going to appoint their delegates, who are more formally and more properly called commissioners. And how many are there going to be? Are there going to be three commissioners that we're going to send to the place at the convention, or are we going to send five or ten or what? Um, they then arrange for the, for the election of the commissioners, usually the legislature elects them themselves. They meet at the appointed time and the appointed place, and from there on, there on it's like almost any other legislative body. They establish their rules, they, um, uh, they elect their officers, and then they consider the uh, ma subject matter that they've been assigned. They have no power to go beyond that, but it, but they but they consider the subject matter to which they with, to which which has been assigned to them, At, and then they decide: Are we going to propose an amendment or not? And if they do decide to propose an amendment, they draft it and propose it. And at that point, the ratification process proceeds just like with every other amendment. Well, whenever we're talking about Article 5 initiatives at ALEC, a lot of the pushback comes because a lot of our members don't believe there's enough guidance in yeah. Article 5 in the Constitution. Um, do you think their concerns are realistic? You know, 
Um, it's not just the ALEC members that have that concern. Some people who should know better have that concern. Uh, but if you think a little bit about how our Constitution is written, and let me give you an example. The Constitution says that in criminal matters, uh, there should be a trial by jury, and in civil matters, too, in, in certain circumstances. The Constitution doesn't tell us that the jury consists of 12 people. It doesn't tell us that the jury has to be unanimous. It doesn't give any voting margin at all. No. Uh, it doesn't tell us that defendants can, can challenge uh, jurors or how jurors are selected. It a doesn't answer any of those questions. So if someone said to you, Carla, gee, we, we, we shouldn't have any more federal jury trials because the Constitution doesn't <laughs> answer those questions, you would quite rightly think that person was off his rocker. Mm -hmm. Well, why, was that, why is that person off his rocker? Well, because we have 200 years of judicial decisions telling us what the founders meant by a trial by jury, mm -hmm. and we can look and, into the historical record and understand it's 12, they have to be unanimous, the defendant gets challenges, and so forth. All of that information comes from the founding era record. If the founders had spelled out everything pertaining to Article Five or jury trial, the Constitution would look like, well, you mentioned it earlier, Justinian's Digest, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the, the way the Constitution is drafted is the outlines are there, and then when there are questions about the outlines, you go back to the founding era practice, and that, will t that provides the other information. In the case of Article V, founding era practice answers almost every question. It tells us how the convention is composed, it tells us what the convention's powers are, it tells us in a rough way what the convention protocols are, uh, it tells us that it's a convention of states, and so forth. All of that information is in the founding era record, and much of it is in court decisions, including United States court decisions issued since the founding. Another thing I hear about often is the specter of the runaway convention. Yeah. A lot of our members and others are concerned about that. Um, they worry that an amendments convention could basically turn into a constitutional free-for-all where amendments would get struck, other amendments would be added. What can you say to allay the fears of the people that really are deeply worried about a runaway convention? Well, uh, there's a short answer to that and there's a long answer. And being a former professor and a former politician, I'm going to give you both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is, any amendment proposed by the convention on any subject still must be approved by three quarters of the states. Mm -hmm. And if you do any, if you have any understanding of how the states are made up at all, you know that any amendment is to be approved is going to have to be supported by the overwhelming supermajority of the American <laughs> people. Furthermore, you know that since it's the states that limit the convention, the states are not going to look very favorably upon a convention which disregarded the state's mm -hmm. own instructions. Mm -hmm. So that's the short answer. That's, that's the ultimate uh, uh, break on that happening. The longer answer has several different points. Number one, we've had 42 conventions of states. It's not like this is a new process. None of those has run away. The people who claim that the Constitutional Convention of 1787 ran away frankly don't know what they're talking about. And if you go to the Article 5 information website, which I administer, you'll see some scholarly work on that subject. Uh, so 42 conventions, not, none of them has ever run away. If a convention proposes something that is outside its uh, scope, Congress can simply say, we're not going to propose a mode of ratification. This is not a valid proposal. The courts can stop the process at any time. Critics often don't know that the courts have quite often intervened in the Article V process to protect its integrity. So you've got all of these defenses, but let me just add one more. Even though we've never had a runaway convention, if it were ever to happen, it wouldn't happen today. It would have happened to one of those conventions that met in secret out of the public eye and away from the state legislatures that sent them. Today. We know that any convention is going to be televised in <laughs> real time, and we know that the members of the state legislature who sent those commissioners to the convention are going to be riveted to the screen. 
And the minute somebody stands up and says, I know we're here to talk about a balanced budget amendment, but I want to talk about daylight savings time. <laughs> Assuming that person is not called to order right away, mm. he's going to get a text message on his cell phone. It's going to say, sit down and shut up or come home. <laughs> See? So if, if it, even if it were ever possible, it's not possible today. Excellent point. And back to your short answer, the ratification process. I've had people come to me with the concern that what if the ratification process is changed during the course of the convention? What would you say to people with that? Fortunately, concern? that's not an academic issue. We have actual experience on that uh, because there have been efforts to try to fiddle with the ratification process from time to time in American history. What those folks don't know is that there's a long series of court decisions, including two very important U.S. Supreme Court decisions, which said that you may not change the ratification process. No, no assembly operating in Article 5 may change the ratification procedure, period. The uh, only argument made in defense of that is the claim that the Constitutional Convention was called under the Articles of Confederation, which required unanimous consent by the states, and that the uh, Constitutional Convention changed the ratification process. It's based upon a mis misreading of history. In fact, the Constitutional Convention was not called under the Articles of Confederation. It was called under an entirely different structure, and the, um, and the, the delegates to that convention had the power to do what they do. The courts are very clear, on the other hand, that any assembly meeting under Article 5 meets under the rules of the U.S. Constitution and cannot change those rules. Again, period. And do you think the nation has reached an inflection point where it's the right time for an Article 5 oh, gosh, Amendments yes. Convention? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, if you look at the founding era record, you say, this is precisely the time that the founders inserted the convention process into the Constitution in order to address. You have a federal government, which is practically everybody admits dysfunctional. Uh, many people believe the federal government has become abusive. You have hugely popular amendments that have been on the public radar screen for 50 years, like congressional term limits and a balanced budget, you know, supported by 70, 80 percent of the people, and yet Congress absolutely refuses to propose them because they're protecting their own prerogatives. This is exactly why this procedure was written into the Constitution. If not now, when? And I know our viewers are going to want to delve more into the Article 5 process. And of course, you authored Alex. Article 5 Handbook for State Lawmakers. Um, are there any other resources that you would suggest? Well, um, one would be the website that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's the Article 5 Information Center, Article V, <laughs> infocenter.com, and it includes uh, objective and soundly researched information on virtually every aspect of the uh, convention process. In addition, um, for those interested in the legal issues involved, I wrote a treatise, a legal treatise, which is available through barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com called The Law of Article 5. It's a legal treatise like any other. It gives all the cases and all the rules and includes citations for everything. So those, were two, those would be two sources I would suggest. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Rob? No, you've covered it very well, Carla. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for speaking to us about this incredibly powerful tool that state lawmakers can use to affect potentially lasting national change. I also want to thank you for your guidance and leadership at ALEC. You're an incredible resource and truly a great friend. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.